Welcome back to the Electronics Inside, the show where we tear down tools, toys and appliances just to find out what's inside. I'm David and we've torn down already the iMac G3, an iMac G4, the iPod Nano and even the MessagePad 110. Seems only fair we go back in time and tear down the original Macintosh, don't you think? Let's tear it down. So this is the Macintosh SE30. Uh, the original Macintosh came out in 1984, which weirdly puts it at the same age as the IBM 5150 that we tore down. And I call that strange because at the time that Compaq and IBM were struggling over portables, or luggables as they were in fact known, the Macintoshes came with this carry handle, which for some reason portability never really gets mentioned, but it's an all-in-one. This has got everything in it. So although it was never really classed as a luggable competing with these machines, it really probably should have done. Let's uh, start by getting the only obvious screws out. And I have to say, these screws have got scratches all over them. So I don't think we're gonna be the first in here. In addition, this is not the crispiest looking machine. This has definitely not been loved in the last, in recent years of its life, I'll say that. So the SE30 came out in 1988, and I believe there's a copyright date on here. Yeah, copyright 1988. Um, and continued through to 1991, when it was eventually superseded. And it was a reasonably competent computer, especially considering this version came out in 1988, only with a black and white screen, which I feel may have let it down but with a graphical user interface built in. I think it was Mac OS version six, although it wasn't called Mac OS, it was uh, something like operating system six at the time. Oh yeah, this one's already full of nastiness. And obviously, as I feel like I've said a good few times, don't trust CRTs, they want to kill you. Make sure you are aware of what you're doing if you're going to tackle something with a CRT in it. You need to know how to discharge it, make sure it's not been, not been used recently and it's not holding any charge. So the inside of this rear case has got this sort of silver in colour to it, and like it's been coated to assist with electromagnetic compatibility, which makes a lot of sense considering there's high frequency, high voltage electronics up here, which would have introduced a lot of interference. I feel like they'd have had to have done something to mitigate interference to other electronics nearby. And we have this, well, it is metallic, but that's barely thicker than tin foil screen at the bottom. So I don't think that's attached. So we've got the analog board at as we're looking at it the bottom, or that would be the left-hand side as you look at it, or the right-hand side from the back. Now it carries all the high voltage uh, for the screen. And at the bottom, this board here is the logic board, which is, as far as we're concerned, the computer. So let's go there next. I don't know if there is anything else on the logic board. Oh, no. Let's tuck that to one side just for a minute. Stand by. I'm going to properly discharge this CRT. See, these screws would appear to hold the power supply in, or is that actually a misnomer and they're holding the analog card to the power supply? Nicely labeled pots and adjustments on here. You can see that it's got focus, cutoff luminosity, width and height. That's a nice job. The insulation to protect the high voltage back of the traces on the analog board, which are high voltage in some cases, insulate those from that sort of screening sprayed on material in the back of the case. It's a nice touch. So the SE30 comes in three flavors off the shelf. Um, there was a floppy drive only, a uh, floppy drive with a uh, 40 megabyte hard drive. Both of those models came with one megabyte of RAM by standard. And then there was an 80 megabyte hard drive with the floppy drive, but also with two meg of RAM, or was it four meg? With more RAM either way, I can't remember which way around it is. And the SE was the first machine by default to come with a 1.44 floppy drive. Before the SE, everyone had come with an 800K floppy drive, not the larger capacity. 
It's interesting that the floppy drive uses a completely different connector. So the hard drive is obviously a very different connector, and this is the SCSI connector. But the floppy drive is also a different connector. I don't think I've ever seen a floppy drive that's not the, what is it, 40 pin connector? No, 24 pin connector for a standard floppy drive? Either way, it's about twice the width of that. Uh, I didn't know Max used different floppy drives. I should caveat that with one exception, of course. Floppy drives on PCs always had the 1.44 or 3.5 inch discs, always had the inject button. With Macs, it's always done in software. So that's obviously made them very different. Okay. From Apple 1990, this could be the original hard drive. Just wondering if there's any indication on here of what capacity it is. Ah, it says Apple 40. So if this is original hard drive, I would think that's the 40 meg hard drive, in which case this was the middle of the range and should still have just one meg of RAM. Although that looks like a lot more than one meg of RAM on there. Okay, got that last screw down here, holding down most of this metal work. Okay, analog board released. Excellent. So CRT left on the front with the front speaker. I mean, I'm reasonably happy to leave those on there. What we've got here is the analog board. Let me remove that from the metal work and we should have a decent layout of all the components on here. It's such an interesting way of handling things which I don't know, I, I, it's still not how my mind would instantly jump to engineering a PC uh, or a computer. And I think that's probably because I'm so used to an ATX standard or an AT standard before then, where everything is done in a similar way to be basically an IBM clone. And the idea that the power supply outputs some really standard voltages, goes through a main board, which then dishes out, look, they've got, it's, this is what throws me. This connector here, which is actually the hard drive power, is a Molex to Molex lead. And I don't think I've ever seen that in my life. I'm so used to just seeing the female sticking out of the power supply that just plugs in the back of the hard drive. This is a weird approach that they're buying what it would appear to be an off the shelf Sony part. And I say off the shelf, I imagine this was commissioned for Apple. You probably wouldn't find this in any other product, but treating the power supply as a off the shelf component and doing the engineering yourself to maintain that control, that stability. And it must have worked because this machine, look at the condition it's in. For something that's clearly run and been filled up with dust and rubbish, it still looks amazing. A couple more trimming pots up here on the analog board. Obviously you've got the screen contrast wheel down here. I think it was that actually pokes through the front of the case. Obviously got a lot of power handling on here. Got some trimming pots, which probably trim some power levels, I would think. Or some frequency that goes to the CRT. And wow, look at the connector that goes to the CRT. That was the, that's the XY scanning fields, I think. They're big, big connectors. I'm not used to seeing them that big. All the caps look in very good shape. There's no bulging, no sign of leaking anything anywhere. But yeah, look at the size of this PCB. I don't know how clearly you'll see this, but the traces that come down here to the contrast wheel are the only thing sort of beside the power supply. And I wonder if that's deliberately to stop noise between the power supply and the board, or whether it was just structurally made more sense to have a big wafer of silicon that they could then screw the power supply to. Because that is essentially how it's held in place. This power supply becomes like a rigid part of the construction of the machine. That's a really clever sort of value engineering thing. And I think that happened in Formula One at one point um, where they started using the, the engine block as part of the construction of the vehicle and not having the extra construction struts around it made it so much lighter. And I think it was that year that they won basically every race because they were so much lighter than the other vehicles. Sorry, throwing really random tangents out there, but that's, that's clever engineering. That's not an accident. Somebody spent a lot of time reviewing how this thing was going to go together and said we're going to make this PCB bigger at cost 
which would have been almost one department, to say then we can bolt the power supply to it and use that as a rigid part of the construction because it will save us money on that press sheet steel and assembly time. It's such a holistic view of clever value engineering to make those coordinated decisions between electronics, buying in a power supply and chassis design, mechanical design. That's not an accident. That's good project management through lack of a better word. So here is the logic board the brains of the outfit through lack of a better description and this is looking particularly grubby but it is great to see everything in place even the battery looks like it's in good health to be honest a bit dirty but otherwise okay so from seeing this as the 40 meg apple hard drive this should have come with one megabyte of ram but this was expandable to 128 megabytes of RAM, which was lots. I mean, the first computer that I call my computer, um, we bought in 1996. It was an IBM Aptiva and came with 16 megabytes of RAM. If we'd seen a computer with 128 meg of RAM at the time, that would have been enormous. Interesting, this riser board up here is, uh, is the ROM. So that's essentially where the operating system is stored. So if you don't have a hard drive, this is where the operating system is stored which is an upgradable module, but it is actually tied in. Ah, it's tied in because it's broken the stand. Can you see you've got a little clip on this corner and it's missing from this side. So somebody put a little bit of twisted bit of wire in there to pull it forwards and hold it in place. So that's obviously one of the repairs that somebody made at some point. We've got one, two, three, four Atmel ICs on there. And we do have a copyright date on the back, 1988. The design of this ROM stick was at least consistent with the early versions of the board. Whether that had updates or whether you could flash that, I don't know without looking that up, I'm afraid. So let's have a look at the memory. So we've got eight sticks. We will have to check out the part numbers on these to work out exactly how much RAM was installed. Interesting, there's a bodge wire on here as well. So that's got copyright Apple 88, 88, 88, 88. So I think this must have been an early version of the um, SE board. And to have that bodge wire on it, they would have fixed that in future revisions. Interesting. A couple of buttons here, a couple of tack buttons at the back, which I guess you would have been able to push through the case. But I don't know what they do. Also interesting, there's this board edge connector here, which is right at the front in an inaccessible place that you couldn't have got to that while this is in the case. So I wonder, what do they use it for? Let's go through on the bottom side, you've got a couple of ground connectors, got a couple of resistors tied up on the top side, and caps. It seems to all be focused around this ROM port. So is that so you could take this and flash it with it all on board? I don't, I don't see the benefit of that because you're dependent on the rest of the hardware. It'd be easier if you've made it a removable module to do that externally. I don't know, that warrants some looking at. So like I said, this floppy drive doesn't use the standard floppy drive interface that I'm used to from uh, IBM clones and other computers where you have that tiny little four pin connector and the 20 pin ribbon as opposed to what have we got here? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. 10. No, this is 20 pin, so it must be a 40 pin for a floppy drive, standard. And it clearly works with Macs because it hasn't got that eject button on the front, which is there for every other device. But this is a Sony drive and it says two megabytes. Now I know two megabyte floppy drives existed from when we talked about the eight inch floppies and stuff, but I've never actually seen one. So it sort of begs the question, is this an aftermarket edition again? Or is this original? State of this. Even the read write heads in there, they're just caked in rubbish. And there's nothing obviously on here screaming at me, I'm a date of manufacture. It's interesting that this, this little label on the side of the floppy drive is actually visible in this window in the side of the case, which makes me think it's at least a, an approved compatible if it's not original. Interesting. Well, I might have to throw this all together and just uh, see if we can get it working and see what the hardware recognises as. 
Okay, I think the Mac SE30 is a really good demonstration of how that high level management of a product and design can yield incredible results. There are just little details which aren't necessarily obvious even in the end user functionality, just how it assembles, which tells me that so much engineering has gone into this and so much thought, not just from the product and how it works, but how it's put together. And that's not something you get from every product. It's very easy for specialists in each of their fields to say, we need this to deliver the results that we need specified. It takes something else to take all of that input and bolt it together to make a clever solution at the end as well. One other thing that occurs to me looking at PCs of about this age or computers of this age, I don't want to offend anyone by calling it a PC. If we compare this motherboard to a modern computer, what staggers me is how comparatively similar the component count is. If you look on here and just see how many integrated circuits, how many individual chips from different manufacturers there are, and there was a time when that integration shrank in about 2000 and you started seeing um, North Bridges and South Bridges integrated into uh, a single unit and the chipset became very much driving the integrated onboard memory controllers, things like that. We also started adding more features. You started having higher quality sound, you started having wireless onboard network, higher quality onboard graphics, because don't forget at this point in time, you were still pretty much dependent on the processor handling your graphics throughput as well. So there might be a video controller, but that's not quite the same as graphics processor. It's just interesting how the cost and acceptability of cost to a consumer has meant the simplifications has just made space for more stuff. Maybe I'm rambling, but I find this kind of stuff the interesting point of looking back at old computing just to see how the market has changed as well as the electronics. Either way, I hope you've enjoyed and if you have any suggestions for teardowns you'd like to see, don't forget to head on to the Element 14 community at element14.com forward slash the electronics inside and let me know. Thank you so much for watching. I'll see you next time.